When you think of World War I, images of muddy trenches, barbed wire, and soldiers charging over the top might come to mind. But how much of what we believe about trench warfare is rooted in fact, and how much is Hollywood fiction? Well, today we're journeying to the Western Front, peeling back layers of myth to reveal the stark realities faced by those in the trenches. As we delve deeper, you'll discover facets of the conflict that are seldom talked about, reshaping your understanding of the war to end all wars. In the West, we almost exclusively associate trench warfare with World War I. However, this is a simplified view of both trench warfare and World War I. First of all, trench warfare was the primary form of combat during the main part of World War I from 1915 to 1917, but only on the Western Front. At the start of the Great War, after both sides attempted to outflank each other to the north until reaching the North Sea, a series of indecisive but brutal battles settled into lines of trenches stretching about 750 kilometers or 470 miles through France and Belgium. Known as the Western Front, this line would remain a stalemate until the German Spring Offensive in March of 1918. However, the Eastern Front dwarfed the Western Front. For starters, it was more than twice as long, stretching some 1,600 kilometers or 1,000 miles from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. The casualties were also much more severe, some 12 million for the Central Powers and 10 million for the Allied Powers of Russia and Romania, along with a total of 2 million civilian losses. These are close to double that of the Western Front. 5.5 million casualties for the Central Powers and 7.5 million for the Allies, along with about a million civilian losses. The larger scope of the Eastern Front made trench warfare infeasible. The two sides couldn't concentrate as many forces in one place, making it easier to break through lines, obviating the value of trenches. The early wireless communication systems of World War I also had a harder time with the longer distances, making it difficult to relocate reinforcements. Consequently, the Eastern Front involved more traditional warfare in the sense of advancing armies, pushing into and outflanking defending armies. This resulted in far more territory changing hands. Not only was trench warfare not exclusive in World War I, it wasn't exclusive to World War I either. Wars around the same time utilized trench warfare such as the Spanish Civil War and the Winter War between Finland and Russia. Many nations anticipated using trenches in World War II, which led to the famous French Maginot Line, arguably the most elaborate trench system ever created, though increasingly mobile technology such as tanks and bombers made them moot. Since then, trenches have seen use in a few isolated conflicts such as the Eritrea and Ethiopian War at the end of the 20th century, but for the most part, they're a thing of the past. Just before we continue, a word from our fantastic sponsor Surfshark. If you ever found yourself stressing over online security, worrying about your internet activity getting into the wrong hands, well, don't worry, Surfshark has your backs. And the best part, Surfshark is incredibly easy to use. Even your grandmother can do it. You just click and you are good to go. Plus, it's also incredibly affordable. You can get all of the fancy VPN perks with Surfshark without having to break the bank. And for you regular travelers out there, Surfshark ensures a slice of home wherever you are. Maybe you want to watch your regular Netflix shows when you're abroad. Well, you can with Surfshark. Plus, you can unblock websites and snag amazing deals no matter where life takes you. Plus, Surfshark has add-on security as well, breach alerts, antivirus protection, they've got it all. Plus, they've got 3200 plus servers worldwide, GPS spoofing on Android, and a kill switch for accidental disconnects. Plus, you can use it on unlimited devices with one subscription. Use the promo code SIDEPROJECTS for an exclusive winter deal, up to six additional months for free. Just head to surfshark.deals forward slash SIDEPROJECTS. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this one. And now back to today's video. When you look at a timeline of a map of the Western Front, it appears as if the lines don't move at all. This is because of that scale, well, they don't. Still, that doesn't mean that for the men within the trenches, the lines were static or permanent. Far from it. Movement was a constant part of trench warfare, including the trenches themselves. By 1915, both the German and Anglo-French armies had developed similar trench systems involving three lines of parallel dugouts, all connected with various perpendicular trenches and tunnels that served for moving between them and running communication lines. The purpose of these redundant trench systems was due to what was, in reality, a very active territorial exchange. The typical battle pattern in something like this. One side would bombard the other until the front trench was basically destroyed. They then would charge the trench and easily take it while the defenders would retreat to the next trench system back. 
There, they would mount a counterattack to retake the front trench, which they would then have to rebuild. This meant a back and forth exchange of territory, usually less than a kilometer. This process was perhaps best exemplified in the Battle of the Somme, one of the deadliest battles in human history with over a million casualties. Starting on the 24th of June 1916, the Allied artillery bombarded the German line for a full week until July the 1st, when the Anglo French infantry attacked from special assembly trenches that they had dug into no man's land. Although the Allies had success along many parts of the line, the Germans soon counterattacked and retook much of the territory. This led to a seesaw battle, where territory went back and forth as new trenches were constantly dug and the front line changed little by little. The result was an Allied gain of just 8 kilometers or 5 miles over the 141 days of the battle. That's just 57 meters, less than 200 feet per day. While this may look like static trench warfare on a zoomed out map, those 200 feet were quite dynamic for millions of infantrymen digging their way to safety day after day. Movies that take place during World War I primarily show infantry troops leaping out of the trenches to run across no man's land and attack the enemy's forward trench. Most of the attackers get mowed down by machine guns, and it's overall portrayed as a bit of a suicide mission. It is true that this was the conventional military doctrine of both sides at the start of the war. This was called a human wave attack, or in Prussian military tradition, Vrchnichtungestanke, or literally, the concept of annihilation. Since the 18th century, these strategies had focused on rigorous military discipline that convinced hordes of infantry soldiers to charge a defensive position and overrun it. However, new defensive technology quickly proved this convention pointless. Machine guns could fire far faster than enemies of hundreds of thousands of men could advance, and no matter how massive and concentrated a force was, the human wave was halted in its tracks. The Germans figured this out first, and as early as January 1915, they started adapting their strategy. German attempts to address the stalemate of trench warfare and the impossibility of crossing no man's land led to the development of infiltration tactics called Huttia tactics by the Germans, a field of war study that has remained prominent today. At first, German officials tried to better equip their charging troops using steel helmets, grenades, and light machine guns. This continued, resulting in high casualties. So in the spring of 1915, a captain named Willy Rohr proposed the use of small units to attack specific specific strategic positions led by competent junior officers capable of improvising in the field. With that, the stormtroopers or stormtroopers were born. These soldiers wore lighter uniforms with leather patches on their knees and elbows to help with crawling. They were issued special grenades and ammunition pouches as well as trench knives and the famous Luger P08 pistol. Stormtroopers and their new infiltration tactics were highly successful, first allowing them to take a French position in the Vosges Mountains. They saw their first major offensive in the Battle of Verdun in February 1916 after a 10-hour artillery bombardment and Storm Battalion 5 took the French front lines while suffering only 600 casualties, ultimately taking Fort Duamont, the goal of the operation. The Allies largely lagged behind the Germans when it came to infiltration tactics, and in 1916, French military pamphlets were still emphasizing psychological support to encourage men to charge across no man's land against all odds. In March 1918, this tactical advantage allowed the Germans to finally make the most gains of either side up to that point, 3,100 square kilometers or 2,100 square miles. Nevertheless, the logistical technology of the time couldn't keep up with the stormtroopers' speed, and they could not be supplied before the Allies could reinforce and retaliate in the Hundred Days Offensive in August, which, combined with an influx of American troops, led to Germany's defeat. Now, it's commonly believed that airplanes first became a major factor in World War II, and the ability to fly deep into enemy lines is what made trench warfare a thing of the past. However, fighter planes and bombers were used extensively in World War I in conjunction with trench warfare, and their roles evolved rapidly over the course of the conflict. In fact, aircraft were used from the first days of the Great War. When fighting started in 1914, the Allies had a force of about 184 aircraft versus 180 for the Germans. These were initially unarmed and used only for reconnaissance. They flew over enemy lines to scout the formation and design of the trenches and pinpoint targets for artillery and infantry attacks. Meanwhile, anti-aircraft guns were still in their infancy. Troops usually just propped autocannons up on embankments to point the muzzles skywards, and this was about as accurate as you'd expect. The planes were basically untouchable, but also incapable of attacking, and enemy planes passing each other would even wave and smile. This didn't last long, though, and pilots started throwing grenades and shooting at each other with their sidearms. In August 1914, a British reconnaissance plane fired at a German counterpart with a machine gun, ushering in the era of air combat. Soon, fixed machine guns synchronized with plane propellers allowed for close-range aerial battles, known as dogfights. 
Despite their abilities to pass the trenches and infiltrate enemy lines, fighter planes' biggest role was arguably morale. With trench warfare on the Western Front stuck in a stalemate of attrition, both the troops and the populations back home needed victories and war heroes to keep their spirits up. The mythology of the flying ace evolved during this time, referring to a fighter pilot who had shot down five or more enemy aircraft. The first flying ace was Adolphe Pigot, a French pilot renowned in the press as Roy de Ciel, or King of the Sky. However, the Germans soon gained air superiority and developed intricate rules and guidelines for victories. The German fighter pilot Manfred von Richthofen was the deadliest of the war. Credited with 80 air combat victories, his fame as the Red Baron made him such a hero for the German people that the government worried his death would crush national morale and insisted he take a grand job towards the end of the war. He refused and was shot down near the Somme River in April 1918. By the end of the war, aircraft had also a more direct involvement with trench warfare, bombing. The first bombers differed from the reconnaissance fighters in that they had two seats, one for the pilot and another for the bombardier. Bombing quickly went from pinpointed attacks on the trenches to raids on supply lines and rear formations. This further evolved to strategic bombing of civilian targets, enemy cities and war factories from indomitable altitudes of over 6,000 meters or 20,000 feet. In fact, strategic bombing came to play such an important role in World War I that many officials held the belief that they represented weapons of mass destruction that could not be defended against except through mutually assured destruction. This led to the prioritization of air forces and military aircraft that preceded World War II. Movies depicting World War I always focus on the action. After all, a two-hour film of men sitting in trenches playing cards and writing letters probably wouldn't do well, but the truth is that that would be a more accurate depiction. Because offensives and attacks were planned over long periods, the day-to-day -day life in the trenches was filled less with fighting and more with tedious chores. This involved cleaning, keeping watch, and of course, digging out and building the trench. By the end of the war, some trenches had become intricate structures with electricity and plumbing requiring regular maintenance. Moreover, frontline troops were regularly rotated out. Since the trench system involved three redundant trenches, soldiers usually only spent four to six days in the front trench, followed by the same amount of time in the second and then the third trench. Finally, they would be rotated to the rear, where there was extensive infrastructure away from the reach of enemy planes and artillery. In the rear, troops could relax, play sports, and see concerts and shows at places like the YMCA, though there was always logistical and support work to be done. And lastly, soldiers did get leave away from the army altogether. British soldiers, for example, received 10 days per year, plus allowances for travel, while French forces had seven days off every four months. At home, soldiers could reunite with their family and friends, sometimes finding that they were even in worse conditions, resources like food and fuel being prioritized for the military. In the end, though, some troops felt that the leave, rotations away from the front, and idle time in the trenches only made the horror of the war even worse. It was as if they were never truly free of it, always waiting for the moment they would be called to face the mortar shells and machine gun fire, and possibly join the nearly 10 million soldiers who died during the Great War. 